So uh, now let's move to some other aspects of sort of the clinical course and the clinical care. Um, and so the next speaker is going to be from the same Stanford uh, Cardinal team, and that's uh, Richard G., who's a physical therapist. You probably caught his name on that long list of folks on the, uh, on the Stanford team. He is a physical therapist at the Center for Rehabilitation Services at Lucille uh, Salter Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford, where he's practiced for 20 years. Um, he's uh, an advanced clinical specialist in the neuromuscular clinics with expertise in FSHD. And he's going to talk to us now about his insights into physical therapy and exercise for FSHD. Richard. Welcome everybody to come. I thank you for coming here. Thank you, FSH uh, Society. And also the families here, I welcome you here. Uh, thank you, Neil and Howard and June for inviting me. Today, I'm talking about exercise and FSH. Um, these two uh, topics are really important to me. Uh, my background, I have a, a degree in genetics and also a degree in physical therapy. Exercise actually came late in life to me as an adult. Uh, I was actually really overweight as a child. Uh, I was probably about the same weight, but about half the height. I was round, and uh, my last name is G. Uh, people used to call me what's called Fei G, Fei G. And Fei G in Chinese is actually fat pig, and I used to be big and round. Uh, I didn't get out of that uh, a pattern until I was an adult. Uh, but the end game is uh, I didn't want to live like that. And I wanted you to think about your end game. I want you to think about what you do in life, what is your exercise pattern? What is your health pattern? What is your end game? And uh, this last, if I think about the last couple of months of my life, my end game was I wanted to ride my bike with my son, and that's what I did. I rode my bike for, for 500 miles with my son down California, from San Francisco to LA. That was my end game. Your end game could be as simple as spending the day at the beach in the water. Your end game could be to be here with your family to learn about FSH. You need to decide what your end game is and to be engaged in that end game. And that's what's going to get you from the next step. Um, so I'm going to review a couple ideas on exercise, discuss exercise considerations, discuss physical therapy, and I have a, a period of time to answer questions. Um, I'm going to talk about this idea called active aging, and this active aging is uh, the process of optimizing your opportunity for your health, your participation, to improve your quality of life. It, 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 it involves both as an individual, as me, and this people group with FSH. The role of active is participation. That's really the key, participation. Not just participation in this community, but in your social groups in your work groups, in your culture groups, in your spiritual groups, in your church, in your clubs, whatever you think is in your day, think about your week, all the people you came across, all the places you went, were you actively participating or were you just in the corner, just there? And I want to, in, it really enforce this idea of ability physical ability, emotional ability, and mental ability to participate into uh, this community. Uh, this is a, a, a graph about functional capacity. Uh, functional capacity is on the uh, X line, the bottom line is age. So as we age, our functional capacity changes. The peak of it, the first dotted line, is about age 30. The second dotted line is further down in line, typically past 60. And as we age, our functional capacity changes. Uh, the top blue line is basically just primary aging. Everyone does primary aging. Everyone goes up, they get stronger, they're more active, more mobile. As time goes, after 30, as an adult, we try to maximize our activity, maximize our emotional activity, our physical activity. Over time, natural growth, about half percent decline in strength, half percent over time, just naturally. 
continue to do that until we're about age 80. Um, some of us have secondary aging, and that's that red line. And that could be from a disease, like FSH. It could be from a fall. It could be from an illness. It could be from a broken hip. And our functional capacity changes. And due to these changes, our capacity gets less and less and less and less. And we reach this barrier that's called a disability threshold. And we get to that place where we're unable to do the things we want to do. And m my job as a physical therapist, as my job as a healthcare practitioner, is to maximize this range of differences. We know in the FSH society, about 20% of us will be disabled or considered disabled in a chair or unable to do what you want to do. But we can change this range based on certain factors. And certain factors were kind of talked about a little bit about sleep about falls, and also functional capacity and exercise. Um, this is a table kind of talking about just a general model about disability and health. And we talk about a health condition, and that's FSH. But a lot of uh, health practitioners go towards the center, look at your body functions, your range of motion, your strength, uh, your activity level, your participation in uh, life, your work, your social, what really you have a lot of control over is this environmental factors. And the environmental factors could be your exercise. It could also be, you know, tobacco use, alcohol use, and also personal factors, how you engage with those envi uh, environmental factors. Um, I want to uh, just quickly read a story, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with Kevin's story, and this is on the CDC website, and he has uh, FSH, and he makes this statement, uh, I want my identity, I, I want my identity n uh, to be, not to be muscular dystrophy. I don't want people to think I sit at home and can't do anything. I don't want ever to have a day where I don't have lots to do. And that's his identity, is to have things lots to do. Now, this is a person who actually was on the Junior Olympics. He got frustrated because he was diagnosed with FSH at 28 or 29. Uh, over time, he had falls. He falled three times. And over time, he used crutches, he used a cane, and eventually made the decision to uh, 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 be in a manual wheelchair. After that time, actually, he became more involved in activity, more involved. He got a, a wheelchair van. He participated and volunteered. He had a job. He got more involved in life. And that's kind of the idea I want you to think about is being involved in life and what is your identity in and around FSH as well as your kind of social, economic, and work life. Uh, I'm going to go in a little bit about research, and this is probably the more uh, popular uh, research study out there, uh, the FACT-2 protocol, and they took uh, about 57 uh, participants in the Dutch area and multi-center trial. They put them in three groups, aerobic activity on a stationary bike, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, at least three sessions, and or traditional activity. So whatever you were doing, you were put in one of three groups. Um, uh, and please note also the Robeck activity and the CBT also got your regular standard of care. After 16 weeks of intervention and also a 12 week follow up, they decided, you know, what is the difference? They put people on this Robeck activity on a uh, stationary bike for three times a week for 30 minute sessions. And they found out that the aerobic and the CPT groups had a lower fatigue level and a better physical performance. In the CTP group only, they saw, oh, I had better sweep, sleep quality and social participation. Um, the kind of the offset of this thing is the end game is aerobic activity or CBT is a positive influence on your life. And you have less fatigue. And fatigue is one of these things we can't quite measure. 
We can measure, say, oh, I have a zero to 10 scale of a certain amount of fatigue, but there are a lot of different ideas of what is fatigue or what is strength or what is endurance. And here's a model. Here's a model that you can think about. On the bottom, we start in the middle, muscle strength, and there's a positive influence of muscle strength into physical activity. When you have a positive influence in physical activity, physical activity goes up. When you have a positive influence of physical activity going up, you have more social participation, so it goes up towards the left. Now, if you're having pain, that has a decreased value on your physical activity. If you have sleep disturbances, as a has a, a positive influence on more fatigue. So you have pain, strength, sleep disturbances, all of these influencing the idea of activity, social participation, or the end game, or that thing you want to do. Just like me, my end game was to, to be able to ride my bike with my, my child. I had to train, I had to think about sleeping, I had to think about my pain. All these things are co-founding influences. This model is specific for FAs to H, thinking about these things that you have control on. These are the environmental things you have control over to affect your physical activity as well as your social participation. Uh, there's another study. Uh, this is an Olson study in 2005. Also took uh, uh, eight patients. It's not a controlled study, but it was a, con a study that took eight patients, put them on a ergometer, just like a bike, uh, for 35 minute sessions, for 44 sessions, and they showed increased oxygen uptake and uh, increased workload, rep self reported self strength, and increased level of activity. Uh, the end game on this was showing that low intensity aerobic training has a positive influence on fitness. Uh, this is also an academic report, and this kind of took a look at exercise in a different way, threw it in the home version, so just said, okay, go home, get on a bike for 30 minutes, five minutes a day. Just a technical question while you're exercising. Yes. Ten years ago, I got one for Frankie and I yeah. for an hour on the workout, and I felt great. Now when I get on it, it's just what I can do. Yes. And I should, so when you're saying get on a bike 60 to 60 hours, is it, is it just, how did you measure it? I mean, I don't, it's hard for me to understand. Sure. Sure, sure. So, yes. So, there are specific things for the first study, the FACT2 protocol, looked at uh, uh, heart rate reserve or heart rate rate, and they looked at max heart rate, resting heart rate. So, you have a, a difference between the two, and they took half of it. You worked at 50 to 75% of your reserve. So I'm going to talk about specific recommendations a little bit later, and uh, it's important you kind of keep that idea because stationary barks are important, but they're not the end game. Question? Okay, great. I'm going to continue to move forward. Um, what's important about this study was that people were given a ergometer said, go home, do it on your own. And they found improvement and that it was safe and it's likely positive. Um, there are... Uh, these controlled studies are a uh, microcosm of understand, a way we understand how uh, exercise improves strength as well as decrease fatigue. And I'll go in through recommendations uh, a little bit later. Uh, how, many, how much exercise do we need in general? <laughs> this is uh, 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 our uh, recommendations are basically about 150 minutes of aerobic exercise per week. And what does that look like? About 30 minutes, five days a week, every other day or so, aerobic exercise. 10 minutes of, of exercise at a time is also fine. A and some people say, is this too much? I can't do that. It's about the same amount of time about watching one movie, one movie or two movies. If you watch a movie, you have time to exercise. What also physical activity recommendation is muscle strengthening two or more days a week of all muscle groups, hips, legs, back, abdomen, chest, shoulders, and arms. And that's on uh, the CDC website. This is a, a new brochure. I know online uh, the older brochure, the 1970s brochure, is available in the FH 
D website. This is a new one available. It talks about physical therapy. And I want to talk quickly about a, a child I know. Uh, his name is Max. Uh, he was probably the one of the more active ch children I ever know, but he had a disability. Uh, a muscular dystroph dystrophy, but not FSH. But he, uh, his main mo uh, level of mobility was in a wheelchair. But because of his family and because of his therapist, he was very active because he went to school. He went to the pool twice a week. His aide brought him to a pool. I was his aide, actually. Tw uh, brought him to a pool twice a week. He had horseback riding once a month. He did trips with his family up in the coast. Um, he walked only about 100 feet, but he was actually practicing that walking every single day. And that was his exercise capacity. And his parents, his therapist, his aide helped him carry out that capacity. Uh, considerations for uh, exercise, maintain muscle strength, uh, body weight, using elastic bands, doing range of motion, and be careful about overstretching. Swimming exercise, very important. Uh, it's exercise without causing stress. Balance is important. And exercise should be done without, uh, uh, to the point of exhaustion. You want to think about less than that. Uh, what I do want to uh, talk about a little bit, I'll talk about what this is called perceived exertion scale. And this is just a scale of how hard anything is on a bike. You know, I can do this when I was 28, but I want you to think about what can you do right now sitting here. Is it no exertion, light, very light, light? You can grade it however you want to do based on your level of activity. And then when you put yourself on a bike for about five minutes or when you go for a walk or when you're in a pool, it could be very light or it could be light. The idea is not how hard you're working. What I really want you to think about is to get those minutes in, to get the endurance in, to get that half hour every other day. It could be any activity. It could be your range of motion activities. That could be light or somewhat hard. And the, the, the sweet spot, the end game, is you want to get somewhere towards between somewhat hard and light. If it's starting to get about somewhat hard, you're actually where you need to be working out for about a half an hour. When it starts to get bit about hard, that's when you want to start to think about, oh, I need to slow down or change the activity so it gets to be about somewhat hard or hard. Anything harder than hard, very hard, or extremely hard, you're probably doing a little bit too much. Um, I'm going to go quickly back to pain. Pain is very common. About 10% of us will have pain with FSH. Uh, they mainly happen in your uh, lower back, your legs, your shoulders, and your neck in descending order. Uh, the idea is to maximize your strength, also minimize your injury from falls, minimize your injury for overuse dysfunction, and also postural dysfunction. Um, now, I really want you to think about your goals. What are your personal goals? What is your optimizing your active participation? What is uh, 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 your maximal function? How do you monitor your pain and fatigue? How do you improve your, your safety? How do you prevent your falls? For me, I have a lot of resources for me, for myself, that I have to be able to exercise. I have the knowledge. I have 15 bikes. I go on bike trips. But what helps me the most is my exercise plan. I get up. I actually park my car three blocks from work, and I walk to work, walk back from work. I walk up and down stairs. I walk about 10 flights of stairs at work. I go to the gym only probably two or three times a week, and I'm on a stair stepper or on a bike. I ride my bike on weekends. So my end game was to ride my bike with my son uh, down the coast, but that's not what I did every day. What I did every day, day in, day out, was these decisions was, how do I exercise? Walking, how do I exercise uh, up and down stairs at the gym? Again, you need to think about what is your capacity, your current capacity, whether you're wheelchair bound, you're ambulatory, or whether you're really thinking about, can I go to church? Can I go to work? All these things that influence have confounding factors in your capacity. Anyone have any questions? Yes. It can be. It depends on how long the cramping persists. 
if the camping persists more than a half hour to hour possibly, if it, definitely if it is occurring for half the day or the next day, the, the morning of the next day. Yes. 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 So back pain and FSH is very common. That's probably one of the more common things because we actually have a imbalance of muscles in the lower body. Also posturally, there's a posture that uh, uh, confounds the back pain. So it's a combination of over posture, overuse of certain muscles, and a weakness of certain muscles. So it's a hard question to answer. I think you need to figure out what's going to maintain and manage your back pain. Is it that a better posture or abdominal binder will help your back pain, or a good exercise program will help your back pain? I think it's going to be a combination of all of them. Great. Thank you very much. One more question, sorry. So eccentric, uh, for definition, is lowering your body weight or lowering or, or moving a muscle in a uh, different capacity. Concentric is moving towards the body. Um, I think uh, what's difficult with eccentric is it's, it requires your body to use a higher capacity. If you follow this perceived exertion, saying, okay, it's, I'm working at a higher repetition, multiple repetitions, 10 to 20 repetitions at a okay, I'm working okay, perceived exertion, I'm okay with that. The only problem is uh, what's difficult for FSH is uh, especially like uh, what a lot of people do is stair climbing, squats, things like that become difficult because the balance and the falls are, are a problem. 